I'd like to welcome everybody to the tax budget hearing. Um, this is just a hearing, it's not a board meeting or anything, there's no roll call or anything. I'm just going to go over the tax budget um, as required by a law, and then later in the uh, organizational meeting, it will be presented to the board for their approval. Uh, as you can see on the screen, this tax budget is for fiscal year 21. It starts July of 20 and goes through June of 21. Um, we're going to start on Schedule A here, which is the first page you see on the screen. And what this list mainly is tax revenue that's coming in, and that's the purpose of the tax budget, to determine millage rates. If you look on here, you see roughly based on our uh, assumed valuation, this could be changed by the Warren County Budget Commission, who would be uh, sent to. But the general front is showing roughly 33.2 million coming in property tax revenue. That includes 1.6 inside mills and 29.42 um, for residential agricultural millage rates. Um, we do not have income tax, you see it's zero. Our bond retirement fund is based on 8.4 mills at roughly 8.9 million to make our debt service payments. And then we have a permanent improvement fund, which is three mills, which is approximately 3.1 million at the moment. We'll go to Schedule B. There's a couple things I want to find here. These are our levies outside the 10-mill limitation. These are all our voted levies. And some of the items I want to point out here, these are actually levies at gross amounts. These are not the effective rates, and we'll go over what the gross is and what the effective is. As you can see, our continuing operating levies that were 1976 and prior, their gross millage rate is 24 mills, but we actually only collect at 13.54. Um, you can see in 1984 we passed a continuing levy. Um, the gross rate then was 3.81. We collected 2.37 for that one. And then our last continuing operating levy that we passed was in 1989. And it was passed at 3.93, and we're actually collecting at 2.47. Um, and right below that is the uh, current uh, general uh, fund emergency levy, which is currently being collected at 11 mills. So the gross is 42.74 mills but actually our effective rate is roughly 31 mills right now. Um, so we collected 31 mills for the general operations. And that does not include the debt, that's just general operations. If you scroll down a little bit here on Schedule B, still a little further, you'll see where it says bond retirement. Um, we have our uh, two levies from 9706 bond issues of 4.8 mills, and then our last one, which we just passed in May of 18, which we're doing our construction project with now, is at 3.6 mills. Um, one thing I want to bring up too, which is, is, is kind of ironic, we've talked about this in the past. Um, our millage currently is lower than what it was back in like FY15. Um, our millage has gone down a couple different reasons. One, we've had valuations go up. And two, we refunded a lot of debt. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get into the debt section. But we refunded about $44 million worth of debt to lower the interest rates and lower the payments, which saved um, approximately $60 million from the taxpayers of the district. Did you say that? Um the 1997 and the 2006 is 4.8, or are yes. we collecting that? Yes, that's what we collect. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Those, are, those are the emergency levy and the bonds, or you collect that what is stated to see make the uh, okay. payments. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we go to exhibit one, which is the next page. Um, some of you, this will look very familiar to This is actually um, a breakout, um, not all of it, but it's a breakout of the five year forecast. Essentially, this is just the general one. This lays out our revenue and expenditures. It has some historical data, 17 um, through 19. Then it shows our current fiscal year of 20, and then of course this is for fiscal year 21. And it also has a column third to the right, which is the first half of fiscal year 22, what we think our, our estimates will be as far as revenue. But like I said, this mirrors our general, or, uh, excuse me, our uh, five-year forecast. And there is several pages of this. If you scroll through or flip your page, um, there's a second page of exhibit two. It's into the expenditures, you see personnel, benefits, purchase services, and so on. Um, it's all broken out by different functions like sports services, uh, non-instruction services, and so on. We go to the page three of the exhibit. Um, it's into extracurricular activities, uh, facilities, and acquisition, and construction. Um, and debt service line, but there's no debt service being paid out of general as far as like. And then on the fourth page of exhibit one, um, it has the estimated fund balance of rolling across on the last line. Like I said, this one doesn't have you know, five years going forward because it's not required for a tax budget. The next exhibit, Exhibit 2, which I think is uh, probably the most important document on here, and it highlights uh, things in yellow here for everyone to see up on the screen. Uh, this is our debt service payments, and this is where the 8.4 mills comes in. Um, what we have is our current year, uh, our fiscal year 20, and our estimated debt payments. We're looking at around 8.9 million in debt payments for the current fiscal year. 
And if you look at the uh, next fiscal year, fiscal year 21, you can see the 21 column over here. We're going to have roughly 8.8 .8 million in debt payments. And that's principal and interest together. Um, we're looking at the fund balance along the bottom. We are carrying a decent fund balance right now, but you can see our payments all have gone up because we've issued more debt for the construction. Um, and then in the last column, we also have the first half of fiscal year 22, and that would be July through December, and it looks like we have roughly, not quite 7 million, 6.9 million debt payments uh, during that period. Like I said before, we've, uh, we'll talk about the Exhibit 6, which goes into more debt. We've refunded a lot of debt, which uh, has been good for the district and, and good for the community. Go to the next exhibit, exhibit three. Actually, it's all the other funds. This is an estimated beginning balance in July 2020, estimated receipts and estimated expenditures, and then an estimated fund balance um, June 30th of 2021. Um, as you can see on the first page of exhibit three, we have our special revenue funds um, broken out. And then you can see we go into the 400s, which those remain the state grants, and then you get into the 500s, down towards the bottom here, and those are our federal programs. And those are based off of current uh, dollar amounts that we have in our current budgets because obviously we don't, we don't know what the grants will be at that point. If you go to the second page of Exhibit 3, we get into our capital projects funds. And uh, that has two very important funds. And we have the three, that per improvement fund, where we have three mills going in there. And then we also have the building fund, 004. And as you can see, roughly, we're, I'm estimating will be around 51.6 out of that 64.6 million that we started with. And we'll probably spend 45 to 49, I'm guessing, by the end of 21. Um, because our project should be towards the end of wrapping up as our schedule will be open in the fall of 21. Uh, after that, we have our proprietary funds, which are our enterprise funds on that page, food service, uniform uh, supplies, and summer education. And we do not have any internal service funds in the district. We go to the third page, Exhibit 3. These are our fiduciary funds. We have a uh, special trust fund, which is our Needs Kids of All, and some scholarship funds in 007. And then we have a non expendable trust, which is a trust scholarship fund. It's a Smith uh, Trust um, under fund 008. And then we have two district agency funds, the 022 fund, which is district agency, and then the student managed activities, which are 200 funds. And those wrap up the general, or excuse me, everything but the general and the debt service funds. Exhibit 4, next page. Shows what our capital outlay will be. The first line shows our capital outlay for the general fund, the 1.3 million. Um, that's comes right off of our five-year forecast. And then all the dollar amounts in the permanent permit fund under capital outlay are all considered capital outlay. And that's useful items, capital assets of five years or longer of uh, estimated life. And then our OO fund, our school construction, that's the 49 million we just pointed out that we're you know, estimated to be spending over the next, uh, next fiscal year. Exhibit five, um, amounts required to pay off final judgment transfers. Luckily, we don't have anything here. That's good. <laughs> Exhibit six, in the uh, final document, which I think is very, very important because it relates to debt once again. You can see all of our different debt issuances on here. We have our 06 and 07 bonds and 11 bonds that were not refunded because they weren't callable. Um, and the 2016A and 2016B are the refundings. Um, you can see what the outstanding amount is um, uh, as of July 1st of 2020. And then also you can see what payments, principal and interest-wise, are due for during fiscal year 21 and once again the first half of 22. So this can give you a, a good idea of what kind of debt we have outstanding at the moment. As you can see, it's about 107 million, um, almost 108, which does sound like a large dollar amount, but that does include our, our newest bond issue. And that also includes on the bottom line there, you can see bond anticipation notes of four million. That was part of the 64.6 when they have been rolling over and paying off a million each year and then rolling over paying a million later in the following year. So you can see overall that is a breakout of our debt, and that's what goes into debt to exhibit two for the debt schedule um, to determine if we're collecting enough millage for our principal interest payments and to make sure you know, everything needs to be paid off correctly. No matter what, if valuations in real estate were to go up and down, that would affect our millage for debt service because we have to collect whatever it is to make the principal interest payment. Um, the general fund tax dollars obviously are pretty much fixed because of uh, the house bill. So that millage pretty much to see what stays the same region goes down. It could go up if you ever had you know, valuations and things going the opposite direction. Um, but the, the one, the general obligation that is the one that we're really concerned, we're concerned with all of them, we're really concerned with that we obviously want to make our, our principal and interest payments. Um, so I said, overall, this is the tax budget for fiscal year 21. Um, this will be presented um, once approved by the board of so. 
and uh, presented to the Warren County Budget Commission meeting where all districts get together and we meet and go over our tax budgets and then the uh, three people on the Budget Commission get together and determine um, our numbers, you know, super accurate or not, and then they look at the rates and what they feel based on real estate valuations, what kind of millage needs to be projected to make these payments. Any, any questions from anyone? I know it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it is important. Yes. It's very important. Like I said, this will be presented to you in the organizational meeting, and, uh, and then once approved, uh, we'll be sent off to the Warren County Budget Commission. If there's no questions, that's, that's all I have for the tax budget presentation. And, uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Before we can call the meeting to order, um, I get to administer the order to our new board members. And then we'll have a nice little document we can sign and make it all official. Um, if you all please rise. Solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Ohio, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge your duties as a member of the Board of Education of the Little Miami School District, local school district, Warren County, Ohio, to the best of your ability in accordance with the laws now in effect and hereafter to be enacted during your continuance in said office and until your successor is elected for Paul. Thank you. Thank you. You can sign each one of your documents and I'll move this up and we'll be all set. I'm candy. <laughs> 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 Start the organizational board meeting. I'm going to call to order this board meeting with a roll call. Mr. Seaver? Here. Chris? Here, thank you. Ms. Grice? Here. Mr. Hamlin? Here. Ms. Horvath? Here. Mr. Nunich? Here. Thank you. Next, we'd like to approve um, the board members the President Pro Temp for the uh, 2020 uh, elections for board president and so on. So we we're nominating someone? Yes. I'll nominate Bobby Grace, please. A second. Second. Any other nominations? Body is.
I'll second. Tony? Roll call, please. Ms. Grice? Yes. Mr. Siebert? Yes. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Mewish? Yes. Ms. Warbeck? Yes. Thank you. All right, we need uh, nominations for President of the I'd like to nominate Bobby Grace. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Nemish? Yes. Ms. Horvath? Yes. Ms. Grice? Yes. Mr. Seaver? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, <coughs> the next part, I, I need an honor. We really appoint these. We don't vote on these. I need somebody to volunteer to be the legislative liaison for the 2020 calendar year. Thank you, Greg. Well, since, since we have a couple of new members, can you explain what that entails? Basically, that's uh, keeping up to date on any kind of legislative activity that's in Columbus that could impact public education in our district. There's some Since lobbying stuff that goes on from time to time in some meetings, but generally it's uh, bringing information back to the board about what's going on in Columbus. Yeah, and uh, at the Career Center, we have them do a little report. Nothing big. I've been trying to keep up with that. I'll volunteer. All right. <laughs> so we'll put down Wayne as Wayne, Mr. Siebert as the, the legislative liaison. Thank you. <laughs> I hear what was in the Cleveland Plain Dealer yesterday. Yeah. It wasn't good. Okay. Um, the calendar year for 2020. I need a motion. Uh, um, what? We need to make a motion for Mr. Sieber. I thought that was just an appointment. I don't think that. Right. Right. I don't think we voted on that, do we? I think it passed, but yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. I need a motion. I'll move. All right, Penny. Second. Diane, thank you. Roll call, please. Uh, Tony, Mr. Nevers? Yes. Ms. Horvath? Yes. Ms. Grice? Yes. Siebert? Yes. Mr. Hamill? Yes. All right, we need a nomination for the Student Achievement Liaison for the 2020 uh, calendar year. And uh, I think there's one meeting that you have to go to and um, you get some information. Uh, I think maybe uh, our HR person and somebody else can give us the information or maybe uh, our PR person and give us information on what's going on in the, the, uh, with the kids or the students. So if somebody would like to volunteer for that. If not, I mean, I'll leave it. Thank you, Martin. I like you. I like you. I'll nominate Mr. Angle. <laughs> I'll second. Roll call, please. Or do we have to have a motion? No. Ms. Rogoff? Yes. Ms. Grace? Yes. 
Mr. Siever? Yes. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Nish? Yes. Thank you. Okay. The next one is um, board authorizations. We need, meet, uh, we need to authorize or approve the dates and the OSBA membership. I'll move. That's Tony. Second.
So yeah, I'm ready when you are, Ms. Grace. All right, I need a roll call, please. Ms. Grace? Yes. Mr. Siebert? Yes. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Hamish? Yes. Here. Ms. Horvath? Yes. Thank you. I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Okay, we have Joanne and Wendy. Roll call, please. Mr. Seward? Yes. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Nemish? Yes. Ms. Horvath? Yes. Ms. Grace? Yes. Thank you. All right, I think we're ready for superintendents. Well, good evening. Uh, there are a couple of, I think, rather urgent matters here that. So we saw the need to have a special meeting here. Uh, the first item on the agenda is a request to approve the Little Miami Local District Compensation Agreement per the Hamilton Township, Warren County, Ohio Resolution 19-1218. Terry, the 
a financial report that says this is what what the what the taxable value is now, what the taxable value will be with the development on it, it's just something that you can see the financials of the project. Something that's they, accurate. They they may uh, uh, they had a projection that they that they were that they created in order to justify the payback to issue the bonds. Uh, yeah, they, they had whole numbers on there, but they didn't have details as far as what the roughly three million for the infrastructure was going to be for. Um, it's a total one there. Uh, I believe it was a whole number from when they brought this up before this particular So there was no details at all? Not no, not detailed at all. We, had, we, we saw what the compensation would be based on the construction of a building on that site and what our revenue would be coming in, but no details on how we laid off. Exactly where the building would be placed, and the detail of what infrastructure would be done as far as you know how many, I guess, linear feet of sewer, road, and all that kind of stuff. We were at least seeing some uh, more specificity around the road infrastructure, even even you know what what does it cost a tenth of a mile to put a road in, and how did you come up with that almost three million dollar number? Uh, and I, it wouldn't have, from my perspective, taken a lot of effort to be able to say, you know, we intend to. Construct, you know, 3.8 miles of road and per tenth of a mile of road. This is how much we project the cost and the infrastructure. Uh, we never really saw any of that, and that's kind of what we were seeking. And yeah, we've seen all the details that they provided. Mm -hmm. So they to present this to the county. Did they have that already, or not? Well, I, I don't know the process beyond their establishment and then filing it with the county. Uh, I do know that their paperwork is not correct as far as uh, compensation agreement because I had to line through and amend dates and, and they had left when they passed it. They, uh, they left the phrase in that the board had approved the TIF. And you'll note on your copy, I lined that out, that we, well, the board never approved the TIF. So, uh, they're going to have to maybe file a correction back to the county. I know that there's Terry's signature is needed on this, and I mm -hmm. think the township's signature is needed on that in order for them to complete the filing. So our so our options tonight are we vote yes and we get the 25% that they have 25 that we've never really negotiated with them. We get the 25% that they're imposing. Yeah. Or we vote no and we get nothing on that piece of property for 30 years. That's correct. That's your two options. All right, that's our two options tonight. That's correct. So is there a, a wild guess on what that 25% in dollar figures would mean each year over the, yes. is it a 10 year TIF or is it a 30 it's a 30, it's a 30 year TIF. TIF. They wouldn't have even had to talk to us if it was a 10 year TIF. Yeah, okay. They can oppose a 10 year TIF and without a vote of the board. Do we know what would need to happen in order for us to have a say in something like this, like if it were to happen? Well, yes, in the process, um, when they sent us notice in October, uh, it, they, they were serving a 45-day notice on us that was their intent to create and pass this TIF. And during that time period, if the board had decided that it didn't want the TIF, it had up to 14 days before their December 18th meeting to vote no on the TIF. We met with them in November and felt like we had a good faith discussion with them to gain some more information and that they were going to come back to us with uh, some more specific detail supporting their almost $3 million cost and uh, limiting what they could use the money for uh, in attachment B. And they did not do that. So the time for us to be able to vote no on it and get them back here passed, we were, I felt we were behaving in a good faith manner and, and, and I, I feel like we got taken advantage of. Right. Mr. Siever, the it's roughly 70,000 more after they built the one building they're projecting. Um, we bought 70,000 a year over 30 years, we bought 2.1 million conditional revenue coming in, um, just based off of what we if there's more outlaws and stuff, they'll we'll obviously have more revenue coming in, which they call their pilots paid over the taxes, um, that instead of getting the tax money, the TIF money. Um, if we get more coming in, it is written up that we get to excess funds towards us. Um, like Greg was saying, we could be made whole at some point, depending on where the development goes. So, 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 so,
So am I right that seventy thousand dollars will be each year? Yes. For a period right. of thirty years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah. and that's in addition to our base of what we already get. We get roughly ninety four thousand now from the parcel. So you get ninety four plus an additional seven. Seven. Correct. Give or take. Yeah. You always and get the base. If that's some a lot. Other buildings are built or other businesses come in. It'll make money from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but above and beyond the debt service payments, the excess will be between us and the, uh, I believe, the cursor. So, Terry, what is being made whole? Um, how is that if, how is that defined? It's defined if, if, if the project was built with no TIF whatsoever, um, and all the current tax rates would have been, we would have collected 100% of what our military rates were. Um, so, that'd be made whole, being made whole. Um, I project it would be somewhere around $6 million over 30 years. But we're going to be about two additional revenue. Um, so there's, you know, there's obviously a, a, a change there. Hopefully, I, I would assume and hopefully, not I should say assume, but yes, there will be more buildings to be built around the other building, I would think. But um, there's, it's all projections, of course. You know, you know, for sure. Yeah, one of one the frustrations, and I, I met with the district PTO reps earlier today, and I, I was talking to them about this, and one of our frustrations is we have more kids coming now, and we need money now. Uh, so, um, you know, the restaurant down there, Shooters, what's coming on the books uh, at, at, with no TIF. Mm -hmm. It was there, it was going to be collected at full value, and now it's a part of the TIF. Uh, the urgency that they, I think they felt was uh, they, they apparently realized that if they, they waited until January and came back, and we talked about this some more, that because shooters had opened and was coming onto the books, shooters could not have been made part of the tip. And I think that probably was one of the determining pieces for them to proceed forward, even though we had, had some conversations that we had new board members who were coming on in January, and. Uh, I think the departing board sort of felt like they didn't really want to speak for the incoming new board with three new board members and two continuing board members. So uh, we we had that conversation with them and they didn't correct us or they didn't indicate that there was an urgency to need to move um, until that Monday before their December 18th board meeting. So was, uh, was Mr. Dieters the Aware of the uh, shooter's uh, involvement in this? Did he have any comments on that? Um, I, I don't know that any of us on our side uh, were weighing in whether or not shooters could be a part of it. They were presenting it to us that shooters was going to be a part of it. Uh, and, and even I, I don't know that I had any awareness that because they were open and they were coming onto the tax duplicate that there was a level of urgency around January 1st for them this to be done prior to January 1st. Okay. So, any other comments? Okay. Questions? Hearing none, uh, any year roll call? Ms. Grace? With reservations, yes. Mr. Siebert? That is a legal vote. Present. So I that be saying. It will require the majority of this board to approve this. I vote present. Mr. Hamill? Yes. Mr. Nemish? No, I'm going to reluctantly vote yes. Ms. Horvath? I'm aggravated, but yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I think in any kind of future test circumstance, uh, our, our legal counsel has indicated we just vote no right out of the box and then they can come talk to us. That makes sense. All right, moving on. Uh, I, that's you, not me. Yeah, that's me. I'm yes. sorry. It's okay. Uh, the next item I have is uh, another, another political circumstance related to school funding. Uh, in the budget bill this past summer, there was language that expanded the voucher, the uh, Ed Choice voucher program. 
And so I'm asking the board to approve uh, resolution 20-001, opposing the state of Ohio Ed Choice Scholarship Voucher Program. Um, you have a copy of, uh, of the resolution that's there. In the way of some background, um, this Ed Voucher Program Frank came about, um, it, it initially started as a pilot in the city of Cleveland schools, uh, probably over two decades ago. And uh, it was around the, the concern that schools were failing kids and kids were in failing schools, and especially the socioeconomically disadvantaged student was sort of trapped in the public school setting. And so that program was set up to basically deal with failing urban schools and to give parents some options. It has since expanded over the years and um, into other urban settings and, and utilizing our flawed report card data uh, as this report card element and assessment program has evolved. Uh, they're taking some elements of the state report card and identifying schools that now are uh, public schools that are not in the urban cores that now qualify or being identified as underperforming. Old Miami actually has one of those schools that's been identified as underperforming. It's our Salem Township Elementary. Um, I think it's our K-3 literacy grade that they that it qualifies uh, that school as being an ed choice school uh, on the very same day that uh, the state released the ed choice school listing they all, the state also released a listing of award-winning schools and our salem township elementary was identified as a momentum award winner for the second straight year in a row for uh, causing student academic growth to go beyond what was expected. And, uh, and so there's sort of a major oxymoronic moment unfolding here where uh, that, I think that building has an overall grade of a B on its state report card, and yet it's identified as high achieving, but also underperforming. So, um, you know, go figure. It's the legislature and the politicians messing with data that is flawed, and so. Um, How do they measure K-3 literacy? Uh, you would probably need to get into the mind of, uh, it, it is uh, very involved and detailed. There the students, they don't take state tests in K-3. There's a KRA, I think KRA is a diagnostic. Beginning in kindergarten, yes. first, second, third grade, and right. the grade is, that match that number the following year, the beginning of the next year. So there's, with the same with the same students, yeah. they, they take the they take the diagnostic at K, beginning K, yeah. and then they, the same group of students moves on and takes a diagnostic. The beginning first, but they're not taking state tests. No, no. Well, the, third, the last line is the state test. Third grade reading. Third grade reading unit, right? So the only group in that K through three that's taking a state test is group. is the last group. Mm -hmm. The diagnostic is. Well, the KRA, the KRA really is, is a state requirement, but and it can generate some data for us to use, but it's not really a tip, what we would typically use primarily to determine how to serve our kids. Right. It's a common instrument the state has mandated. We would prefer to use other instruments uh, in lieu of the KRA. Um, there are districts that play games with this. Um, we give it prior to the, to the start of the year, and we do all the screening before the kids show up. There are other districts that get into the school year, and they give the KRA after they get into the school year. They have to have it done, I think, by a certain date, but it, you know, if you're assessing a student after they've been in school for five or six weeks, that looks a little different than if you're assessing a student who, who hasn't been in the classroom and is just now showing up. So we don't think it's beneficial to take class time and to, to load that on the teacher 
to try to do that down, do that because it impacts student learning in the classroom for every student in, in districts where they do that. But you can look a little bit better if you get four, five, six weeks of instruction in before you give that paper. Right? So it's a game. I see. It is. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Roll call, please. Mr. Siever. Yes. Mr. Hamlin. Yes. Mr. Nemish. Yes. Ms. Horvath. Yes. Ms. Grice. Yes. Thank you. All right. I think I need a motion to go into the executive session. Right. I'll move. Okay. And wait. Roll call, please. Mr. Hamlin. Yes. Mr. Nemish. Yes. Ms. Horvath. Yes. Ms. Grice. Yes. Mr. Siever. Yes. Thank you.